Hello and welcome to Jump Advisory Group. Start your team, uh, uh, jump start your team performance, right people, right place. As people start to log in again, it's a very busy webinar, so thank you very much. If people can just drop a little note into the chat room to say that you are here, it'd be very much appreciated as people start to come in. As I said, right people, right place. You know, creating a cohesive team with complementary skills rather than a disparate set of individuals who potentially unsuited to hit your strategic goals and targets are really important. I think, you know, I remember sort of, it's like that all of us have had that operation where we've had great teams and you're excited about going to work every Monday morning and it motivates you, it inspires you to achieve more goals. You feel that belonging and you feel that you're... You've got, they've got your back. The team's got your back. And it's also about having fun. But I've also worked on the flip side of that, where I've dreaded that Sunday evening going into work, knowing there's going to be arguments going on. There's people that aren't really tuned into what's going on. The business isn't aligned. And so today we're going to talk about all of those things, about the controversy that that brings. So as an employer, we've got to think that we are creating that environment. So let's discuss the right people and the right place and the importance of winning and building a winning environment. Can't quite promise, as Paul Sharp put out this morning on LinkedIn, that it'll be the same as the presidential debate yesterday. But if I do call someone, you know, thick or an idiot, then I apologise <laughs> uh, for that straight away. So let's jump straight into. So what, you know, I think it's really important that we think about what do modern recruitment businesses, what are they going to look like in the next three to five years? So as Mr. Sharp, as you sort of mentioned the president election, let's throw, throw it open to you, Mr. Sharp. Okay, th thank you. And, and thank you to, to everybody that messaged me after last week's webinar about uh, the topic of playing uh, Van Halen jump uh, before the webinar starts. Um, <laughs> If you want to redirect all those queries through to Mr. Greenwood, uh, he <laughs> controls the music and the slides. So the more pressure you're under, the more I'm sure you'll get your way. Thanks, Howard. Um, great, great topic. Um, great area for debate. I, I, I think for me, I think the starting point has got to be, um, you know, what is the plan for the business? And, you, you know, the more I talk to people, the more I realize that either there is a vague plan, there's no plan, or the plan that is in place was pre-COVID. So I think the starting point, before we even start to think about what does the future of the recruitment business look like, I think it's what does the future of your recruitment business looks like, is the question that I'd probably ask. And therefore, you know, I start to think about where are you now? Where do you want to be in three years' time? And, and what does that vision look like? And, and, and by that, I mean, are you able to describe it or put some monetary value in terms of if that's what your, your vision's about, you know, what, what, what does that get you to in three years time? And then once you've mapped that out, I think it's then being clear on what your values are that are going to help you get there. What are the, the behaviors? And this is all going to play into the people bit, by the way, but what are the values? What are the behaviors? And then breaking that three year plan down into years one, two, and three. And within each year having 90 day sprints, and within there, you'll have objectives around things like financial uh, measures, uh, customer metrics, uh, operational excellence, and you should definitely have one around people. So people is part of the plan that is going to enable your strategy and your vision to come to life in order that you can get the business from where you are um, to where you want to be. So I, th I think the starting point for me is everybody should be getting that strategy out. If you haven't got a strategy, now's the time to do it. You need to do that in-depth analysis of where you are today, looking at your markets, the competitors, your services, your channels, all that needs to be reviewed. And then you need to be really clear on what your three-year plan is. And then you need to be clear on what you're going to communicate to your team. So that, that's probably my starting point, Howard. It's an interesting view. So let's sort of push that on to, to Paul, because I think on this, Paul Jacobs, that we should be looking at as well is, you know, how do you involve your people in those plans? How do you get your people part of that plans? We're talking about the right people, right place. Yep. I think it's important that people are involved in that business planning process. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. And I, I think Paul's point is extremely valid. I mean, we, nobody's been through anything quite like this before. Um, even even me, considering that most people seem to think, Mr. Sharp, especially that I was born in about 1890, but um, <laughs> I, I, I've never been through anything like this. Um, 
and I wasn't around at the end of the Second World War, again, just to get rid of that rumour that's circulating. So it is unusual. I mean, we've all had three-year plans uh, in businesses. Uh, we've got to review everything. I mean, we've said many, many times that whatever plans you've had in the past, and I'm sure you've done it, tear them up because they're not relevant any longer. We have to look at the next month, the next three months, and I uh, and keep going beyond that point, constantly reviewing on a month-by-month -month basis the plans. But I agree with Howard's point. It's very important to get people involved in your business. But I also think this is a chance to really, as we've been saying, and I've been talking to all of my clients, and we've been acting on this point, it's time to review and remodel in many respects. That's not to say that every recruitment business needs remodeling, but there are nuances and changes, I think, for every company to consider very strongly. And one of those areas, I, I feel, is this whole issue that we've talked about endlessly about 360 degree recruiters. You know, I, I've said for years and years and years, uh, right back to uh, 1946, that the fact is that 360 degree recruiters hardly ever existed and probably never really existed in any great numbers. And it's fair to say that, that I think we've reached a stage where we really need to work out what it is our clients need from us and whether we've got people doing the right things in the right jobs to paraphrase this point about right people in the right place. Are they doing the right work? Um, should we have, as I believe we should have, um, candidate care staff in the office who do not sell, who work purely on looking after candidates, particularly during the period of post-placement, pre-start? Um, do we have mentors working within the organisation to onboard people that we place in jobs? Should we have, ultimately, experts in HR uh, law and so forth, working as associates or part of our business? Should we have resources, researchers, closers, business development people, and so on and so on? Now's the time to really be making those changes. And how do you know what to do? Speak to your clients. We have to get very, very, very close to our customers. And let's look at the services that we're going to be offering going forward and the markets that we need to be developing in and indeed some markets we need to jettison. We know, and we've been saying this for a long time, you can't be everything to everybody. And it's a, it's a simple fact now that you have to become expert in several markets or a single market and not try to spread yourself thinly across each of those markets, which again, briefly lends you to, gives you back to the point of what kind of people have we got in the business and where can we use them effectively? Howard. So I think there's an interesting sort of couple of points on there that you start to sort of build people back into the marketplace and look at that. And you talk about putting the right people in the right, right job. And I think as leaders, you can't play the office. You need to understand the responsibilities of all the people in their job. And this sort of leads on to, to the next question, which is regarding sort of, you know, do people think about their paycheck or do th people think about the business? What are they there for? So let's, let's look at that, Dave. So, you know, do the people in your business make your vision, purpose and plan actually come to life? Dave, I'm, I'm interested on, on your thoughts on that one. Yeah, and I guess my answer is in three words. I hope so. I really hope so. I hope that the people you've got in your businesses bring your businesses to life because if they don't, you've got a potential problem coming up in the next few months. Because I genuinely believe the next three months will determine the next three years for each of your businesses. Because I think we're at that critical juncture as we navigate together what coming out of this crisis means while it's still in existence. There's great opportunities for everyone. And, and as a leader, you can't do it all on your own. So I hope very much that your people are capturing what you're telling them and are being part of that story. We spoke last week, didn't we? We used that, that phrase or that word, infectious leadership. And as a leader, it's your responsibility to pass on that vision, pass on the purpose, your ideas and your thoughts. And the big question for me to ask yourself is not in leadership. It's not, do I like you? But it's, do I trust you? Do I trust your vision? Do I trust your plans? Do I trust the culture that you've created? So that the people that are working for you are asking that question of you as the leader. If we've learned one thing from this crisis, it is that hunger for connection. People want to be connected to leaders. 
They want to be connected to people they believe in, to purpose they believe in, to the vision they believe in. And that is part of a winning mentality to make sure that you've got the, the right people. Um, and it may just stop with you. You may be the, uh, the leader of the business, but you may have another partner in your business. It may be a husband and wife team, brother and sister team. It could be you, a sales director, finance director. You could be the leadership team for your business. So for your people, the, the bottom line is about trust. Of course, they want to be paid. Of course, they want flexible working. Of course, they want the, the right candidates to place and the right clients. But um, what builds the better better culture um, on those in those organizations is trust. So I just encourage you as leaders to help focus your people on what they can do, not what they can't do, because then you'll be able to determine whether you've got the right people. Um, you hear things like, oh, so-and-so isn't hiring, or so-and-so can't be extended because of what's going on, or everything's on hold. Well, okay, that may be true. So what are you doing about it? Where are you going? Where are you placing that other candidate? What are you doing with that extension? If, if that sector isn't working, what is working? So if you've got the right people who believe in your purpose and believe in your culture, they'll be doing all that they can. Focusing on progress, not necessarily perfection, but focusing on progress. And I just encourage you as leaders to celebrate wildly you know, reinforce the values you set, reinforce the culture of the business um, and show your behavior that, that it matters. Uh, get your managers coaching, get your managers leading to make sure that the positive behaviors and cultures are demonstrated across all of your people. I think there's quite a lot sort of pushing there, Dave. We've talked about this quite a lot. And one of the exercises I remember doing at uh, a company for quite some time was to sit down with the leadership team and the human resource team and identify people in that organization that I wanted to clone. I want to yeah. look at the people that I wanted to clone and I'd write down their characteristics and their traits. And what I found was that most of the people that I wanted to clone and benchmark weren't always the best salespeople. But what they did was they created a great team environment because their behaviors and values were aligned to the vision and purpose of the business. And they made the plans of the business come to life because they were aligned with that. And not only were they internally in line, but then what I found was that they were externally in line with our customers as well. And so that sort of benchmarking of people in that way was really important. And I think then what you need when you sort of grow a business like that is you need something that allows the structure to grow because sometimes when you start to identify the people for promotion most promotions are based on the financial uh, achievements of that person where sometimes if you're looking to create the right people right place the right leader may be there completely right under your nose but they're hidden behind the person that's doing the biggest sales and therefore you've got to start to think about how do you change that what do you do about that so the, the roots for successful people need to change rather than this sort of linear line of yeah you're the best salesperson therefore you go up the chain sometimes you're missing the best managers and quite often a quarterly basis what I would look at is the makeup of my team and how my team made up and I'd have you know type A type B type C type people and I'd look at my business and I'd I'd suddenly realize hang on I've got too many A's in here or I've got too many B's therefore when I start to look at the things that were going right and going wrong did I have the right people in the right teams that had the right capacity to enable things to move forward so as a leader on that type of thing what I did was I prioritized my communication I nipped conflict in the bud because what your comment there Dave is about trust is absolutely right if you quite if your employees trust you then they can have conflict but if they trust you to make the best decision on their behalf then you can nip that conflict in the bud and it doesn't become you know a little poison dart within the business that then grows and spreads from there so to be a true leader you've got to recognize that as a as a as, a, as an employer that your employees are in that sort of fashion and in that mold so it's quite an interesting sort of view on that Paul Sharp, you've been working with, you've just come out of a business that was very into the company ethos and the employee ethos. Give us your quick thoughts on, on that before we sort of move on to the next question. Thanks. And, and, and 
there were lots of thoughts going through as, a, as, a, as, as I was listening to, to you speak then, Howard. I think the first thing th for me is what, what you measure speaks a lot about you as a business leader and, and about your business. So whilst measuring, uh, you know, NFI head and revenue is important, measuring uh, attitude or how people are aligned to the values is equally important. Uh, and so having values, I, I think, is really key to creating the right culture but keeping the values alive and aligning people's performance to the values is probably more important. So on a quarterly basis, I would always sit down with my, my leadership team and we'd have a conversation about not only the results, but about the behaviors aligned to the values um, of that organization. And, and I think that really helps to create a positive culture. So just, you know, just to, to reiterate the comment that I've made, what you measure speaks volumes about what your values really are. I think that's really important. The second thing I'll just quickly articulate, and, and this is a story that has been circulating on social media recently, but the Navy SEALs measure two things. They measure the ability, stroke skill, and the level of trust. And the Navy SEALs have one motto. They would rather take somebody with average ability, but 100% trust into the battlefield than somebody with outstanding ability and no trust. I think that one through. They'd rather have somebody average performance, but somebody with the trust explicitly. If you bring that back into the business, and, and I know we'll probably touch upon this, you know, how many people are there in an organization where you may have a top biller, but they're not the person that lives and breathes the values. And, and personally, I think those people need to be weaned out. Weaned out. Maybe I could just um, also back you up here, Paul. So here's, here's a paradox for lots of businesses listening. Uh, and I, I won't obviously mention my client's name, but we, there are decisions to be made. I mean, in one of my clients, we have a high biller who is causing all sorts of issues. Uh, I'm obviously not going to speak about who it is. Um, this talks to the point you're making about behaviours and values. And I think that this is a, it's a difficult decision for people to make. Do you uh, exit somebody that is capable of billing um, a decent or a large amount of money for you because their behaviours and values are misaligned with your business, which is a really tough call, especially at the moment? Or do you, you, know, or do you keep them and consider the fact that it's going to be extremely difficult for you to develop your business, bearing in mind that the behaviors and values are also external. I mean, the way people behave internally can be tremendously damaging, but if you're going to build your business and expand your client base, particularly around things like um, uh, retained and exclusive business opportunities, which is built on that whole trusted advisor model, then you have to have the right behaviors and values uh, pe penetrating your, company, your, your clients' businesses from within your own organization. So there are some difficult calls to make at the moment. And I think that um, I know what I would do, and I've done it many times in the past running businesses. At the end of the day, I think it's absolutely critical to get people in your business who are aligned to the behaviors and values. And um, I guess it's a tough call, but in the end, in the long run, the medium to long run, you'll make more money by having the right people who are aligned with your business and your culture, than maintaining somebody in your business who is by virtue an internal terrorist. That's my opinion. Maybe people shaking their heads, I don't know, listening, but I've always, I've never been shy to voice my own opinion. I think the point is, if you want to build a brilliant business, you need a brilliant culture. So, yeah, I think you're absolutely right there, Paul. And I think, yeah, that again goes back to that comment about, um, you know, that troublemaker, they are blocking the sight of the business owner and the leaders in that business for the brilliant people that have stood behind that person because yeah. that person is taking up so much light. Um, and I need to write question four because you've almost answered question four for me there, Paul. But, you know, don't worry about that. We'll come back to that. It's not as if we've planned these things or anything along those lines. I'm sure I will. I'm sure I will. But one thing that we start to look at when we start to look at all of these things and we start to look at aligning culture and aligning the business is all about the business leader and as we said last week as goes the head goes the business so the question is do we have the right leaders in place 
And yeah, I've always talked about, you know, surround yourself with brilliant people because that will start to rub off on you type scenario. Dave, you've also run some sort of big businesses and sort of grown up through businesses and had sort of lots of different leadership teams. Give us, give us your view of, you know, that, that question. I think um, one of my favourite quotes that's come out of this year is from a medical director of an international aid charity that you guys know that I'm, uh, I'm on the board of. Um, we've got 750 staff, but we're working in the Middle East and we're running a hospital and a school of nursing in a, in a, in a, in a pandemic. So you learn a lot. I've learned a lot. The leader of that used this phrase, said this phrase, that leaders absorb fear and exude hope. And I'd ask you, as leaders in our recruitment sector over here, which of your leaders are absorbing fear and exuding hope? Who does this in your organisation? And to Howard's point earlier, they may not even be leaders in name yet, but they could be leaders on your sales floor. They're the sort of people you want. I've had leaders in my time, some of them I've followed out of sheer curiosity without thinking, where on earth are we going? No real, no real direction, but there's a charisma there, but I'm kind of following them out of curiosity. It's not great leadership, because if you're a person in that organization, you want to know where you're going. So if you've got the right people in your organization, and let's assume that you do, have you got the right people leading them? I think in these times, in these next three months, you've got to have your A-team. You need your A-team playing their A-game. And the right people in your organisation deserve the right leaders. And uh, it was Stanley McChrystal who led the Iraq war, the, um, the Americans in the Iraq war, who, who articulated really well when he said, who do you want in the foxhole with you? Who are the people that you've got, whether you're a team of four, a team of 40, or a team of 400? Who are the people that you want with you who are going to get you through this battle these next three months as, as you shape your business? And the next bit, you know, the next bit uh, uh, may seem a little bit strange, but let me ask this question. Do you love your business? Do you love the business that you're running? And more importantly, do you love your people? Do they know that? Because that will come through in all that you do, in your culture, in your trust, in the way that you promote people, in the type of people you promote. As we said earlier, may not be the very best people in terms of billings, but it could be the best people. And a couple of questions that you can ask yourself. What do I know to be true about my leadership style and about what I want the people to uh, to have in, in my culture uh, and the leaders that I promote. What needs to be said that hasn't been said? Have you got leaders that will stand up, be truth tellers, be trustful, and from a customer perspective, from a candidate perspective, uh, from an organizational perspective, say the things that need to be said and have the freedom to say it? And as a leader, who are you when you are, when you are at your very best? Ask yourself that question. What are you when you're at your very best? And that's the sort of skills and behaviors that you want to engender in terms of culture for the leaders that you create. Honestly, grace, direction, tenacious, courageous, they're realistic. They're the sort of things that I think really good leaders have among their people. And I think it is good for leaders uh, in your organization. I think we talked about, Just, right, Right, people. I'm just right, trying to throw, 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 throw some alternative in there, Dave. The, for, for me, I think it's about being authentic and 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 being true to yourself. So we talk very much about you know values and culture and positivity and and about the team and everything else. But but not every agency is like that, and and they're not wrong. It's just that their values are different, and and therefore it's about you know money and it's about individualism. And, and I do know some really successful agencies that have a completely different culture to what I would certainly want, but they're very successful. So it, it's, not always, it's not always built on team, is, is what I'd say. It's not that you don't think it should, uh, sorry, shouldn't, but I'm just saying it's not always. I think there's a quite an interesting point that Paul that both both you bring up there, and I think the question that I've always asked and sort of looked at when you start to create right people, right place, mm. is that you know 
I see a lot of people who have got really poor leaders and they put their poor leaders in charge of really good teams. And what they find is that that team then starts to suffer. And then they have great leaders and they put their great leaders with their poor performing team. And they find that that poor performing team increases, but not by a great deal. And to me, when we start to look at leaders, leaders should be leading the best teams and developing the best teams. You'll get the best results out of those people all the way along. And we've got to start to think about that is that if you want the right leaders in the right place, you've got to have the right people in the right place as well. So if you've got the best people, put them with your best leaders. If you've got the worst people, then you need to sort of think about what you're doing with those people. Paul, Office Angels was a, a great success for you, you know, over 16, 18 years. Okay, give us your view of sort of putting the best leaders in place and the right people in place and how that worked for Office Angels. Oh, I mean, thank you. I, I, there's some interesting points here. I, I remember we got to a point, we had about 60 offices around the country and um, we decided to double the network, um, which, which I did in about uh, two years. We opened about 60 offices. But one of the big drivers for doing it was that we were beginning to lose people who we did not wish to lose. Um, they were, they'd reached a kind of ceiling. Um, area regional managers were not moving. And their people were ambitious, uh, they felt they were achieving, and so they decided to move on. And when we did the exit interviews, they were saying, look, we don't want to leave, but we, we can't get promoted. And I thought, this is crazy, because I'm losing great people who love the business, who, and we love them. But the bottom line is, they can't get along, and they're going to come back and attack us. They're going to attack the business, they're going to set their own businesses up, or they're going to go to our competitors, what am I going to do about it? And I think one of the big drivers for me in opening more and more offices was to um, provide a promotion channel for the people in our business that they could continue to develop their careers and stay with us as long as they wish to. It proved to be a great success and we used the strengths of the people who were obviously demonstrating their ability to lead by giving them more and more leadership opportunities and growing their areas and their regions. And it's an interesting point that I remember talking to a good friend of mine who owns a very large finance recruitment business in London. And he said to me, you know, we had a board meeting, Paul, and we've decided to open in New York. And I said, wow, that's amazing. You must be very excited. He said, actually, I'm not. I don't actually really want to do it. I've reached a point in my life where I could do, live without it. But he, I said, so why are you doing it? He said, because the guys in my business desperately want to do it. They want to open in New York. And if I don't allow them the opportunity to do that, I'm going to lose them. I think um, this is an interesting point. If you've got really great people working for you, you're almost compelled to continue to develop and expand your business to provide them with the opportunity to stay with you and help to uh, develop and, and make the business flourish. If you refuse to allow them to expand and develop their careers, they're going to go off. They're going to leave, not with bad feelings, but because they have to. So I think that you're in that, in that great place, in a sense, where you've got great people, you're nurturing and developing those guys, and you want them to stay because they're clearly great people, they're part of your family, um, and you feel you have to grow the business to accommodate that. That's a great place to be, and it's unquestionably where we need to be looking. I mean, just circle back briefly to the point that the boys have made, and I, I'll just back that up. I think we need great leadership. If you've got people at a time now particularly now in this really extraordinary situation who are not stepping up to the plate, you, again, difficult decisions have to be made. If they're responsible for a, a, a number of different people and they're exhibiting fear, they're exhibiting a level of procrastination around decisions, they're not, as, as Dave described, showing purpose and positivity, they're gonna harm your business and you do not have the time to give them to come round, you have a limited period of time to get these guys back on track. So as the owners of your business, you've got to work very, very closely with your leaders, with your managers, pumping them up, getting them to think positively, get them, imbue them with a sense of security. One of the reasons people demonstrate fear, and this is back to caveman mentality, is the fire's gone out at the entrance of the cave and the wild animals are gonna come in and eat you. You've got to give people a sense of security, of purpose. Back to the point about where's the company going? What's the vision for the company? What's in it for me as an employee? Where am I gonna go in the company? And as leaders, we've got to have that purpose and that positivity. They've expressed it brilliantly. Soak up the fear, exude positivity. If you can get that going on, you can achieve anything. There's real opportunities 
to grow market share already my clients are doing that in many instances let's not be fearful let's be positive let's be excited about the future even during these difficult times so as the caveman analogy there paul is that something from your your past your real life as as, as your age has come through you've but being at the, 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 the caveman situation. Well, as you, I th- can, I think, <laughs> as you can see, I'm coated in hair, so you can tell this is the, the Yes, the, the hair suit oh, there. I think, I think, to me, the, the thing that we start, start to think about is we start talking about you know, experts and jack-of-all-trades, and we start to think about putting experts into the, the, the right position. Now, whether the 360 works or not, we need an expert in each position, and therefore you need an expert manager in each position. And But to have that, it all goes back to that business plan. But it also goes around the succession plan as well. And I always talk about the infinite versus the finite succession plan. If you've got a finite succession plan where you've got glass ceilings, which is what you had there at uh, Office Angels for, for a certain uh, time, yeah. and people start to leave because the finite plan doesn't allow them to go any further. But if you have an infinite plan where people can see their infinite career growing, then people will start to look at that and people will start to drive to go beyond and above what they're normally meant to do. And that's when you start to create that purpose, that passion for a business. And that's where trust all comes into that. So let's move on to the final question um, because we're sort of running out of time. You know, what about those people that don't fit into your culture and into your strategy? Sharpie. Um. Really interesting one. Um, f- for me, um, I, I, you know, without hesitation, I, I would want to be surrounded by people, regardless of performance. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, nobody can accept performance, but I, I would want people that were on board all day long. Um, and it's about you, you know, nurturing and and you know, developing people. We said last week one of the key, one of the three key ways to engage your your workforce and to motivate them during this period is development and training so you know i don't think we should be forgetting about the importance of doing that but equally i wouldn't be you know training or developing somebody that wasn't part of the the longer term plan um i think for me um you know what i always hated was somebody saying you know we've let so and so go or somebody's left us now and to be fair you know they were never part of the team or you know they were never part of the the long-term vision and and then you know start to be overtly critical I absolutely hated that because if that was the case, then we would have been dealing with it in a professional manner and, and not using it now as an excuse that they've left to, you know, in effect, sign that individual off. And I think going back to trust bit, you know, we talk about authenticity and empathy and logic. I think when you are exiting people, going back to that triangle, uh, which I talk about a lot and, and operating in that way and, and demonstrating behaviors in that way, is really important because if somebody leaves your business and it's logical to everybody, the impact is going to be absolutely minimal. And by logical, I mean, everybody knows they are the, you know, the the person in the corner who is the terrorist, the person who's always negative, the person who's always disruptive. If they leave and your values have been also very, very clear, they'll see that as logical. If somebody's billing 80 grand a year, and, and you, you know, publicize the threshold as being at that level for that role, you should be billing 120 grand a year, then it's logical that that individual leaves. So I think when people leave a business, it's really important to manage it in, in, in terms of making sure that trust is not affected at all and making sure you, you, you're true to yourself, the decision stroke process is logical and the impact is, is minimal. And the last thing I'd just say, is I always treat, I've always treated every lever as if they are somebody that I'd want back in the business. I want them to always leave the business and feel positive, even if it's been a negative experience. And again, if you take the emotion out of it and you make it more based on logic and data and, and, and sound judgment, then hopefully you can you know, part company uh, with individuals in a proactive way, even with those people that aren't the easiest people to get out of the business. I would still make it very clear and I'd be true to my word and I would be still talking, you know, very highly of those people after they've left the business. It speaks volumes about you as a leader. So I think I said, and this sort of write up for this uh, 
webinar that we were going to be slightly controversial in certain areas okay so i think the first thing that i would start to look at is when we start to look at those people that don't fit into your culture fit into your strategy aren't delivering your vision you have to find the right role for people okay and what a lot of people do is there's a lot of sentiment in recruitment and so there should be but there's a difference between sentiment on people that have been in the business for a long time and sentiment against people who've been in the business in a long time but aren't actually performing and performing very very well so you have to make the decision and it's going to be a hard and critical decision to remove that person from the business it's all the same the same as what paul was saying there about that uh, internal terrorist that person that is you know taking up so much management time because they moan about everything they complain about everything etc and you may have team leaders that are in this situation you may have high billers in this situation i remember two defined examples uh when i was managing at cp i removed two high billers and i'm talking three quarters of a million pound plus billers from two divisions one from uh, an off well from two offices and what i found was within six months those offices had trebled their turnover why because all of a sudden the blocker had been removed and it, then it was all about trust and what i found was as a leader that all of a sudden that other people then started to trust me because of that so sometimes often that ceos make hiring decisions based on their set experiences and often as they sacrifice logic and they sacrifice a process for that and we've got to start to think about the logic do they culturally fit the business they could be the best skills in the world, but if they don't culturally fit the business, what problems are they going to cause once they get within that business? So it is about creating positions for the right people. And this is another thing that we start to think about. And this is what I would express to every people now. Right people, right place. So those people don't fit in your team at the moment. You should really remove those people from your business. However, a lot of people are saying to me, I haven't got a position at the moment. But if the right person came along, the right behavioral person, not the right skilled person, you should try and find a position for that person because that person will add benefit to your business constantly and drive those things through. So we've got to start to think there's lots of things about cultural fit and strategy that is really important. And I always think once you have one bad apple, then it will disturb every other apple. Once you remove that apple, then it allows the others to blossom. And we've got to start to be man enough about that. And if those people need removing from the business, then they should be removed from the business. And I know, Paul, Jacobs, you've, 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 we've, we've had this conversation about a, a quite a number of our clients when our clients have had this conversation with us and we've used each other as a sounding board with the client about should we remove should we not yeah you know give me give me your views on on this one as well no, uh, thanks Howard. i think this look this is a profound point you know you, you as a business person as, as somebody that's led businesses and, and advises businesses have i've done that for many many years now you, you know, for me, it's about providing an unbelievably good service to your clients. And, you know, as business leaders, you have choices to make. Is it about chasing the money at any cost? Or is it about providing superior service in every respect to your clients? So they are not just pleased with your services, but are over the moon and thrilled with them. And for me, it's a really easy answer. It's all about the service. It's all about the level of customer care. If you provide unbelievable customer care, better than your competitors, the money follows. If you've got people working for you that don't give a damn about customer care, their candidates, their clients, and all they care about is, is scoring points, with making money, with, and they're not bothered about who they tread on, whether that's internally or externally, you've got yourself a business that's gonna, never going to get anywhere. For me, it's everything, everything it's, it's about is about providing unbelievably good care and attention. And I've spent my life, my entire career, over 40 years in the recruitment industry, desperately trying to thrill clients, hopefully succeeding most of the time. Money follows if you do that. Look at all the brilliant businesses in the world outside of recruitment and the experiences as consumers we have with certain organizations. And you'll find companies that do everything they can to thrill you, even if their products or services are more expensive than others. And we pay gladly more money to some, to some companies than we do others because of the experience we receive. 
This is the key point. If you have people in your business that do not believe in that ethos, then you have the wrong person in your company and you need to let them go. It's as simple as that for me. I don't think these are that difficult in terms of decisions. What do you believe in as a business owner, as a leader? Is it about providing unbelievably good service? If it is, these are easy decisions. So that goes back down to the leader then, doesn't it? About a leader being accountable and making accountable calls all the way through the business. And if you make the accountable call that says what is right for the business. And I think sometimes when you start to look at managers, managers again are all about look at me, look at me rather than look at my team. And I always thought of it was very interesting when I came across managers who were look at me, look at me rather than look at my team, then you start to see a very big difference of what's going on. And it was quite interesting that I, I, I was doing some work with a, an ex colleague of mine who now asked me to do some mentoring work from in his, in his business. And he said, I was looking through the old CP things. He said, and there's a lot of Christmas dues where all the awards were given out and your teams were winning lots of awards, H, but I never, ever saw you on the pictures. Hmm. And I said, if you look on all the pictures, I'm on all of them, but I'm hiding somewhere in the background. And all I was doing was pushing my team forward into the limelight and letting them bask in the glory because Ashley. as a manager, it's about them doing it. Actually, H, you were drunk under the table. Let's <laughs> bring it on quite, quite, quite potentially. <laughs> uh, but it was about them and I felt it was all about them. As a leader, I thought it was all about my team and I felt being the catalyst to them being successful was my job and my responsibility. And therefore, I felt if I could release their potential and increase their potential constantly, then I had the right people. If I had people fighting against that constantly, I found that they weren't the right person to be in the business. And I quite often removed them very, very quickly from the business. Or in some cases, I pushed them to a manager where I thought that they fit their culture in their team and they blossomed in that. So I did think there was a, there's, there's two different types of culture. There's the cultural fit of the business and the cultural fit of the manager as well as we move forward. Uh, Dave and Paul, have you got anything else to, to add to that? Just one for me, and I'm always big on sort of takeaways and, and I would you know urge everybody on the call if, if they haven't already, is just you know put two simple metri uh, axes on a, on a piece of paper um, performance and results on, on one axis and, and attitude and values on the other. And on there, just map, put the initials of everybody in your business on that chart and you'll quickly realize and start to home in on the individuals that you need to plan uh, either to resolve any issues if you can or upskill them if you can or swap out your business. And it, it's, you know, having that plan and doing it, doing it when you're in control and therefore you're not losing, you know, a headcount in your business and doing it in a really planned manner so you're not disrupting clients and all the rest of it is really important. But map everybody on the chart and do that on a cyclical basis. And, and just lastly for me, how just bringing it back to, to the second key takeaway, which if, if you haven't already, going back to the starting point, you need to write down your three-year vision and and it needs to have something in there for everybody else. They need to buy into it. And that comes back to all the leadership stuff and everything else. There's two key takeaways from this week that I think people really need to uh, embrace and, uh, and crack on with. I think your vision is right there, the, to write that three-year vision down. And what a lot of people do, they'll write their business plan, their strategy, their figures, et cetera, et cetera. What they never actually write down is the behavioral traits that they want within their business and for each area of their business. And I think that's equally critical as any business plan as anything else. What's the behavioral traits of what you want of the people in your business? Dave, you look like you wanted to, to say something there. Yeah, I, was, I was going to say, I mean, I think this is a real opportunity for leaders to step up, to stand taller, and to release leadership within their organizations. And I noticed on the slides that we've got, there's a quote from Doris Cairns Goodwin, who wrote what I consider to be the best book on leadership that I've ever read. Take us back to the American presidential debates that we started this on, if anybody um, watched them last night. And she wrote a book called Team of, Ri Team of Rivals, all about Abraham Lincoln and how he blended a whole team of leaders together to make his presidency so memorable. Um, it, it's about 10 years old, maybe even 15 years old. But if you can dig it out, it's quite a weighty tome, but it's the best book I've ever read on leadership. 
It's quite an interesting thing, Dave. I, I, I read a book um, many years ago called East of Constantinople, and it was all about the people who were similar to Lawrence of Arabia. And what they were actually doing was trying to get the tribes from Turkish border right through to the, the stand borders, uh, Pakistan, Turkistan, etc., etc., Afghanistan, to actually fight against the Ottoman Empire. And it was interesting there management style and what they did to do that and how they led from the front and it was a it's a really interesting book to see how these crazy Englishmen were walking across deserts that no one had ever walked across etc uh, etc et but were leading tribes that had been fighting against e each other for thousands and thousands of years bringing them together to fight against a common cause you know some some great tips in there again about leadership so as we come to the end of this uh, webinar I just want to sort of enlighten you into the into next week so thanks very much for attending Next week, we're going to be controversial again in who is calling the shots in your team. Is it you? Are you inspiring as a manager your team, uh, your team and individuals, or are you held hostage to fear of change because of the individuals within your team? So again, it's going to be a really interesting sort of debate on what's going on. And then the final one in the series is on October the 14th, where we're bringing Phil Davis, ex-Welsh Rugby International, ex-international coach, who's going to be talking about building world-class performing teams. And some of the things he talks about are going to be really interesting about taking teams like Namibia to the World Cup and how he got them to qualify for the top 20 in the world to get them into the World Cup and then how he dealt with some of the things that we've talked about today prima donnas and how he created a team ethos where everybody was playing in the same attitude and the same skill set etc it's a really interesting sort of conversation so if you've booked in to this week obviously you're already booked into next week and on the the 14th if you know the people in recruitment that are interested in these type of things I think it's time that recruitment pull together and got the right attitude that if we work together harder and better, we'll create a far better industry for each other and we'll all start to prosper, then feel free to invite them along. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for your time. This is Jump Advisory and this is Jumpstart Your Team Performance. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks, guys. Bye, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys.